I was just talking to our next speaker, and um, uh, we were talking about worry, and I remember, I recalled something he said, probably quoting somebody, but I don't know, but uh, he told me even, or told us uh, in high school, when I was a junior in high school, that worrying is atheism. And uh, I still remember it to this day. And I think many of, too many of us worry about the devil. And uh, we have to be aware of him, but worry about him. He's a loser. Anyways, with that being said, please welcome our next uh, speaker, Father Casper Prescorius. There's always somebody who's going to remind you of something you said, especially in a sermon, then I have to practice what I preach. Can you imagine that? So anyway, um, well, the topic of this uh, conference or this, this talk this afternoon is about the devil's plan or plot against Fatima, against Our Lady of Fatima. And I want to issue a disclaimer that I am not speaking as a Fatima scholar. Um, I know that there are many people that have researched many details about the Fatima apparition, and I'm not one of them. However, I have been aware of it and have studied it, and I would like to offer these observations um, just from the standpoint of common sense, just what uh, that tells us. And uh, we, I guess we would start with the obvious that the devil is real and the devil is God's enemy. The devil is Our Lady's enemy. He's the enemy of each and every one of us. And the devil has a plan. That's another word for plot. And we all know the importance of planning. What happens when we don't plan for something? It's chaotic. So planning is essential for anything to succeed. And I do believe the devil has his plan worked out. He knows that he's not going to be the ultimate victor, but nevertheless, God is allowing him to work against good. And this ties right in with the mystery of evil, how it is that God allows evil to exist. He who abhors the least sin nevertheless permits it, and he does have the power to, to bring good out of it. And so that helps to answer the question, why didn't God just annihilate the devil after he rebelled? Satan and all of his minions, we I think it may have been upwards of a third of the angels that rebelled against God. Why not just annihilate them? Because they are just going to be working against God, working against good. But in his infinite wisdom, God allows the devil to exist. He allows the devil. He limits his power, but he does allow him to use his power up to a certain point. And so this is what we are going to be aware of. We need to know our enemies plan. As a matter of fact, that's super advantageous. In wartime, spies try to find out what the plans of the enemy are. They take enormous risks to find that out so they can bring that knowledge back and then use it for a better offensive. So we know that scripture has many references to the work of the devil. He appears in scripture. And we even find him appearing to our Lord himself and daring to tempt him. It's always the gospel for the first Sunday of Lent, how the devil takes three uh, different approaches, three different temptations, one to gluttony and sensuality, the second one to pride and presumption, and then the third one, materialism and worldly prosperity. And it's, it's, I become more aware, it's dawned on me more, how dastardly it was that the devil would even quote scripture 
Yes, the devil was quoting the Bible. He was quoting Psalm 90 when he said to our Lord, throw yourself off of this parapet, this uh, pinnacle of the temple. The angels will catch you. It says it right there in, in that psalm. And needless to say, that was a very uh, inapt, unwarranted, presumptuous, sinful expectation to just for no good reason to throw our Lord to throw himself off and for the angels then to catch him. Of course, he's God. He can do all things. But again, the, this is the, think, the plan of the devil. And that reminds us of something. And I, I remember Father Dennis, God rest his soul, among the many, many lessons that I learned from him. I remember him saying in his uh, many a sermon, the devil will tempt us to do something good at times in order to keep us from doing something better. That's how clever he is. So never think that we're going to outsmart the devil. This is why we need to seek spiritual guidance in our spiritual life. This is why we need to cleave wholeheartedly to the teachings of Holy Mother the Church and to make sure that we're not deceived by the devil. He is far smarter than we are. God did not take away his knowledge and God did not take away his power when he rebelled against God. He lost charity. He, he, he lost all love. He was filled with pride. But again, God allowed him to continue keeping his angelic power and knowledge. So St. Peter tells us, and this is among the many references to Satan in Scripture, in 1 Peter chapter 5, the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, strong in faith. And that occurs, by the way, in Compline every day of the breviary. Resist ye him. So the words of the first pope reminding us of the power of the devil. I believe, and I don't think St. Peter meant to exclude this, but not only does he go around as that roaring lion, he also, I think, goes around as the silent assassin. Taking advantage of people that, that aren't really fighting him and deceiving them. It kind of ties in what I, what I was saying earlier, how he will try to get us to do something good. This, don't you want to do this good thing? But there's something better that God wants us to do. So, uh, so yes, the devil works in various ways. Thank God his power is limited. And I tried to look up this reference. Uh, it's in one of the commentaries. I think it's St. Augustine where he talks about the devil being like a chained dog. So instead of being this vociferous, uh, dangerous Doberman pincher that can attack us and kill us, God uh, does restrain his power. That's good to know. And he's given us his own power to use to protect us, our Blessed Mother's power, our guardian angel to help us in this battle. But uh, that idea or that analogy that I think, I think it was St. Augustine that gives about you know, the chained dog is don't get too, too close to him. If you get bit, it's really your own fault. Okay, so uh, be aware of that his power is limited. The devil has a particular hatred for our Blessed Mother. And we read in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, she shall crush thy head. So the devil knows that he's going to ultimately lose. He's the biggest loser, you might say, of, of all time. However, God allows him to win many a victory, a temporary victory or, um, well, victories uh, up to the power that God lets him use. But he hates Our Lady because she is the one deputed by God to crush his head. I will set up enmities between thee and the woman. 
I know we've had Fatima conferences in the past on this theme. She shall crush thy head. The enmity is there. St. Louis Marie de Montfort talks about it over and over again in true devotion. These are really the two sides. It's Our Lady's side who is with God, and then there's the side of the devil. Ultimately, you belong to only one of those two sides. And of course, we want it to be with our Blessed Mother. So why does the devil hate this so much? Because, and St. Louis explains, he would rather be conquered, he'd be, rather be humiliated and punished by God than by the humble handmaid of Nazareth. He knows that, by definition, angelic power is greater than human power, and yet God has bestowed such a power on Our Lady that she will crush his head. She's already been crushing his head in various ways. She began to crush his head in her immaculate conception because that was undoing the triumph over our first mother, Eve. So does he ever squirm? every time he gets crushed in one way or another by our immaculate queen and mother. And there will be the final crushing at the end. Again, with God's power and in fulfilling God's plan, God wants our Blessed Mother to take such an important part in the economy of salvation, as theologians would say. So... One, one other thought, by the way, about the devil being allowed uh, to do his, his wickedness reminds me of, a, of something that's been brought up about the famous Roman or Latin poem, the Aeneid, written by Virgil. And of course, it's partly myth, partly history. Scholars are always trying to figure out what was real or just a symbol or symbolic, but, but the goddess Juno, is she hates Aeneas, and she's constantly his enemy throughout the whole epic saga of his travels. But Juno knows, and of course, this is just pagan mythology, obviously, but Juno knows that she cannot prevent him at the end from fulfilling his destiny to go to... Italy and to lay the foundations for what later on will become the, found, you know, the beginnings of Rome. So, but Aeneas is the distant founder. All she can do is keep causing him troubles, keep causing him problems, send storms to besiege his, him and his men when they're on ships, etc., that kind of thing. So obviously there's no truth to all this pagan mythology, but the point is it kind of an, it gives that idea of what the devil is allowed to do. He knows he's not going to win in the end, but he's going to cause all the harm that he can. He's going to be working against God. He works against our Blessed Mother. He's going to be working against our striving to, to do the will of God and to, to fulfill God's plan. So when we look at the apparitions of Our Lady, we see the devil trying to cause obstacles, uh, the devil causing problems in this regard. And I'd like to begin by referencing some of the modern day apparitions of Our Lady, uh, allegedly of Our Lady, that are we should not take as coming from Our Lady. And I'll tell you the reason why. And I would see this as the devil inspiring people to do things, to you know, try to distract people from real issues. But uh, let's, let's just reflect on some of these. Uh, the, the, the apparitions at Bayside, New York. Have you heard of those? Bayside, okay. Basically, that went on from 1970 to 1995 to Veronica Lucan. And how do we know not to follow it? Although there were condemnations of Vatican II and modernization, there was still that Im implicit or, if, or maybe even explicit support of those are the real clergy. That's still the real church. And it was from... Uh, Veronica, that was this idea that there was an imposter Paul VI, that the real Paul VI was down in the dungeons of the Vatican, and it was the heretical uh, Paul VI that was doing all the harm. 
So uh, anyway, it was never approved by the church, and this is a key thing that's needed to make sure that we're not being deceived by the devil. Apparitions must be approved by the church. They are subjected to the most rigorous scrutiny, first on the local level by the bishop of the diocese, and then it's submitted to Rome in almost all cases. We need the assurance of the church that this is not going to be a deceit of the devil. So definitely cross off Bayside. Garabandal, it, those apparitions allegedly, alleged apparitions went on from 1961 to 1965, but they regarded John the 23rd and Paul the 6th as true popes. And right away we know our lady would not uphold that. They have proven to be false popes because of their promotion of this new religion since Vatican II. Um, Akita, uh, allegedly Our Lady appeared in 1973 to a nun there in Japan, but there, it was always pray for the pope. Well, she would be acknowledging then Paul VI. And again, it wasn't approved by any traditional Catholic Church authority, none of these apparitions, so we should not be following them. A Medjugorje, oh my goodness. Supposedly, they're, they're still getting apparitions after all these years. I mean, we're, we're talking about apparitions in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. God doesn't work this way. Our Lady doesn't work this way. When we see the messages that are destined for revelation, they're usually short, concise, to the point, but not this ongoing drama. You know, and every day at such and such a time, apparition is going to happen. And Medjugorje has been quite supportive of Vatican II. And then one other one that was over in the former Yugoslavia, I forget if it's in Serbia or Croatia, but, but again, never approved by traditional Catholic authority. There wasn't uh, traditional Catholic authority to approve it. And then Nisida, which began up uh, as, as early as 1949, Nisida, Wisconsin, 1949 lasting till 1965, but there was support for Paul VI. Now, what is a common theme through all of these apparitions is the great chastisement, and actually we would agree with that. We do expect something to be happening because God punishes for sin. That's in, that, that will happen. We don't know exactly the time or the way, so we don't take issue with that. But with these other reasons, it's enough for us to just say, I cannot safely follow these. Let's stick with Fatima, let's stick with Lourdes, let's stick with La Salette. These are absolutely approved apparitions by the church and they cannot be deceiving us in any way. Now, let's talk about miracles. How would the devil try to hijack this situation, so to speak. Well, the devil is capable not of miracles, but of, of um, you know, very dramatic occurrences. And if you've ever read about exorcisms, you know what powers the devil is allowed to demonstrate through possessed people. And so the devil is able to do signs and wonders that are explained in terms of his angelic power. But that is not a miracle in the true sense of the word because miracles are allowed by God only, only for a good reason and only for the cause of good. And it can be hard to distinguish those. So again, we see that the practice of the church is always to authenticate miracles, to rule out the possibility that the devil is using his signs and wonders. And by the way, have we not heard those words every last Sunday after Pentecost? Matthew chapter 24, false Christ and false prophets will arise, this is our Lord telling us, and will show great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. 
So our Lord promises us that the devil will work signs and wonders explainable by his superhuman powers, which God allows him to use, but they are not miracles by definition because they do not, they're not for the purpose of good. And again, the devil is smart enough to deceive people. If he can get people to follow signs and wonders, and don't, doesn't ever, don't people love to see a phenomenon? Something amazing? It's a human tendency, a human weakness. So the devil knows that. And so, again, the possibility of those signs and wonders happening to, dis, to deflect people from the right path. So again, we, we're reminded of the, whole, the entire purpose of the church, this infallible guide. It can never give us false doctrine. It will always give us safe teaching, safe guidance, and it will approve miracles and apparitions and tell us when they are truly authentic in that, in that, in that manner. Um, I remember reading about uh, Lourdes, how in the vicinity of Lourdes, and that happened in 1858, that in that vicinity there were some other apparitions going on. These were not true apparitions. These, this was the devil disguising himself to try to distract people from the true happenings that were going on at Lourdes. I'm, I'm not aware of if, if, uh, if there were any false apparitions like this around Fatima, but it, we should not be surprised. Again, the devil works very cleverly to, uh, to deceive people. And we need to, again, be humble, obedient to Holy Mother the Church and, um, and on a personal level, seek, seek spiritual guidance so that we are truly walking a good path, uh, a, a path that God would, walk, would want us to walk in our spiritual life. So having said all of this, what is the actual plot of the devil against Fatima? Some of it has already happened. Some of it continues to this day. So let's begin with the happenings right there during the apparitions. We all know what happened to the three Fatima children. At one point, the Freemasonic mayor of Urem, which was near Fatima, literally kidnapped the children. And he threatened them with death, being fried in boiling oil, if they didn't reveal the secret. They, these, and these three children so heroically kept that secret as Our Lady told them to. They were going to die, then reveal the secret. And they withstood that. And he tried every way he could to get it out of them. And I remind you, too, that the, the Portugal was suffering from a Freemasonic government at that time. There were clergy being sent to prison, even tortured. Uh, there was a general suppression of going on of Catholicism at that time. It was a very difficult time. And the Catholic faith of the Portuguese people was able to withstand that. So what a blessing it was in so many ways that Our Lady came to Fatima. And it did help lift that persecution, that very strong anti uh, clericalism that was going on. So the three children were uh, were thrown into prison. The crowds were dispersed at time by police, and they were not, you know, they they used there was pr police brutality going on. And by the way, may I remind you that in Lourdes, the Freemasonic government of France was also very unhappy about the Lourdes apparitions and of course they weren't going to win this one in the long run but in the short run they were trying to keep people away trying to uh, su suppress Bernadette and her you know the messages that she was told to manifest but um, so again this was this was something the devil wanted of course and um, then even I even think that at the miracle of the sun, remember how 70,000 people were there. There were many scoffers, many uh, people waiting to 
rub their hands in glee when the alleged miracle was not going to happen. But then they were with everybody else, uh, seeing the sun dance through the sky, plunge to the earth. Everybody thought they were going to die. Did that convert all of them? I don't think so. It converted some. But sad to say, the hardness of the human heart that it can see a miracle and still refuse to believe, even though they panicked at the moment. Remember, our Lord's enemies did not accept his miracles either. They were so obvious. The raising of Lazarus from the dead, and then they were plotting how to kill Lazarus a second time. <laughs> So if somebody doesn't want to believe, no amount of miracles will really ever help. They, there has to be a good willingness there to see the truth, to see what's good. So again, the devil was fighting against Fatima at the beginning. Now, there was also not enough of a response to Fatima, sad to say, after it happened. How do we know this? Because Our Lady said, if my requests are not heard, if they are not heeded, there will be a greater war. This war that's going on right now will come to an end, but there will be a greater war that will happen. Stop and think about that for a moment. World War II was avoidable. Now, non-believers, non-Catholics won't accept this, but this is the word of our Blessed Mother herself. And not only that, she prophesied if her requests were not heeded, communism would spread throughout the world. Communism was known, well, it was known in theory. There was a few communist revolts already in the 19th century. But the phenomenon of Bolshevik, Soviet communism spreading its, its falsehoods throughout the world was not thought of. So that would be, again, something that the devil wanted, Our Lady's request to not be heeded. Her re not enough Catholics, in other words, were praying the rosary. Not enough Catholics were amending their lives. Not enough communions of reparation were being offered. Not enough of a response to what our Blessed Mother came to say. So we're reminded there's always a consequence for not listening to God, for not listening to the most special messenger he has ever sent. Of, um, besides, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord is the greatest divine prophet of all. But after our Lord... He sent his mother to tell us what to do. Fatima is just as relevant today. That message of Fatima is, is just as important today as it was in 1917. And it is the devil's plot to get people to not heed Our Lady. Don't forget, the devil has a plan for you. Uh, you know, this really struck me one day when I, this was a good 10 years ago, I was happening to fill in on the, uh, the Boston Mass Circuit. Uh, at that point, we were flying a priest many Sundays, I think almost every Sunday, um, or at least some Sundays of the month to, to Boston to, to take care of the fledgling uh, parish that was being established there. And I remember having a very clearly a conversation I was having with one couple after Mass, and uh, I forget her, the, the, the lady's name, but she just said something, said it very matter-of-factly, but it just really struck me. And it was, you know, the devil has a plan for us after all. I mean, I kind of knew that, but the way she said it just... Wow, really <laughs> hit me hard. That, how true that is. The devil has a plan for you and me. And we don't want that plan to be fulfilled. And I believe part of that plan is for us to neglect daily prayer. 
to neglect the daily rosary. If he can do that, if that happens, if he can help, of course, it's ultimately our own bad choice, but if he can help with that, that's a, little, that's a victory for him. His, that's part of his plan. So, so not enough of a response, and, then there, and therefore, World War II happened, and we saw communism spread throughout the world, and communism is alive and well. And we even have members in our own government who are communists that are trying to bring about, in some way, their version of that wicked, that wicked, uh, philosophy, that wicked set of teachings that denies God, that denies God-given rights, that, that takes away fundamental human freedom, human property, decisions that God has given to individuals to make not the state. Let us go on with the devil's uh, plot against Fatima, the suppression of the third Fatima secret. Everybody knew it was the it was like it was like something that you would have had to have been living under a rock for many years not to know that some that the third secret of Fatima was supposed to be revealed in 1960. Now I was just an infant at that time, so I didn't know about this, but I've been told by many a person, oh yes, we knew that the third secret was going to be revealed, and when Sister Lucia was asked, she said, it is to make things will become more clear if it's revealed in 1960. Well, what was happening in 1960? Well, already John the 23rd was planning his council that was going to depart from the faith. And he had, we know what his thinking was because from the very get-go, from this first uh, address to the cardinals and bishops at the beginning of Vatican II. I think he used that phrase, there's too many prophets of doom and gloom. You know, we, things are going to be much brighter, cheerier. You know, we're going to have a new Pentecost. He, these, he didn't say those exact words. But he also had told somebody else in a, that had been meeting with him about, we're going to let some fresh air into the church. And he went over and opened up a window. Well, we know where that fresh air came from. It's a very unfresh air from hell. Because literally heresy is to be found in Vatican Council II, and then all the devastating changes that came about after that um, just, just continued the snowball rolling down the hill. So anyway, the third Fatima secret, what excuse did John the 23rd give for not revealing it? He put out, I believe, a one or two sentence uh, notice for everybody to read. It does not concern my pontificate. Now, Nobody at that time was questioning, you know, validity of the of the of him as pope, um, and we realized the vicar of Christ has the supreme power in the church. However, I would think that any holy and true pope would have revealed that, because again, the evidence for it being directly from our blessed mother is very secure, very safe. And so there went everybody's help, or hopes and expectations. Nothing was going to happen. That secret was going to remain hidden away. That was a triumph, I believe, of the devil. It was part of his plot to suppress that secret. And it was revealed only 40 years later. You remember during the, uh, that momentous year 2000, when we were obviously going from the, to the 20th to the 21st century, um, it almost seemed apocalyptic. The third fathom of secret is soon going to be revealed. And then we found out something that was really not any kind of message. It was just a description of a sort of vision. 
And when you analyze it, it just does not fit in with the first and second secrets. The first secret was, and I'll, let me read to you, because it's, we need to know what, what, what the secrets are. You have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. So I believe that is, this is all written as one paragraph here, so I'm not exactly sure of the demarcation between the first and second secret, but really it's just one secret in three parts. So those three children had to carry that weight around them of having seen hell. I can't think of a more life, well, of course, seeing our Blessed Mother was the most life-altering thing for them, but to see the reality of hell where sinners go that have died in mortal sin, it just beyond anything a human being could endure. They said Our Lady had to sustain us. So that was definitely in the first part of the secret. Now, Our Lady then went on to say, the war is going to end, but if people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the reign of Pius XI. So there was no Pius XI. This is absolutely prophecy. And some will even question, why 1938? Because after all, the official start for World War II was September 1st, when Hitler invaded Poland of 1939. But it makes sense when you realize that Hitler was already committing acts of war. He was, he, had, he was very soon to march into Austria, take it over, march into the Sudeten land, take it over. And then in the east, Japan was already at war with China, grabbing large swaths of land from the Chinese. So yes, it does make sense that the war began in 1938 even though historians say September 1st of 1939. And then Our Lady prophesied the night illumined by an unknown light that happened January 25th, 1938. So Sister Lucia, of course her two cousins had already died, but she, when she saw that unknown light, she knew, yes, this, this war is going to happen. Our Lady goes on to prevent this, I'm sorry, let me, uh, I might be repeating here, I was about to punish the world for its sins by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the church and of the Holy Father. To prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my immaculate heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace if not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. That happened. My parents' home country of Lithuania was one of those nations that was at least politically annihilated. It's, it was just absorbed into communist Russia. Um, Russia did spread her errors. And to this day, can we say Russia is Catholic? Everybody knows the answer to that one, no. In the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me and she shall be converted and a period of peace will be granted to the world. In Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved and that's where it ends. Now, the, the alleged, um, and I say alleged, uh, third secret was this. Now, 40 years later, which does not keep to the timetable, it does not make anything clearer. And we believe that that third secret of Fatima was prophesying the loss of faith of many, many Catholics. Do you see why that would not fit in with John uh, the 23rd's plan for, a, uh, the, for Vatican II? It would have condemned Vatican II from the start. It would have been the biggest wet blanket to put on Vatican II. And we have seen that 
secret, if we can surmise that it is so, the loss of faith, it has happened. Yes, nominally there are 1.3 or 1.4 billion Catholics, but how many of them have the Catholic faith? Not a majority, a small minority at best, because they have been led away from the truth. So this is the secret. After the two parts, which I have already explained, at the left of Our Lady and a little above, we saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand. Flashing, it gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire, but they died out in contact with the splendor that Our Lady radiated towards him from her right hand. Pointing to the earth with his right hand, the angel cried out in a loud voice, penance, penance, penance. Now, we can agree with that, but again, let's listen to the rest of this. Then we saw in the immense light that is God, something similar to how people appear in a mirror when they pass in front of it, a bishop dressed in white. We had the impression that it was the Holy Father. Other bishops, priests, men, and women religious going up a steep mountain at the top of which there was a big cross of rough hewn trunks as of a cork tree with the bark. Before reaching there, the Holy Father passed through a big city, half in ruins and half trembling, with halting step, afflicted with pain and sorrow. He prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on his way, having reached the top of the mountains, mountain on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him, and in the same way there died one after another the other bishops, priests, men and women, religious, and various lay people of different ranks and positions. Beneath the two arms of the cross there were two angels, each with a crystal aspersorium in his hand, in which they gathered up the blood of the martyrs, and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God. I don't have time to explain all of the problems with this. I mean, in a way it sounds good. It sounds, okay, it's talking about martyrdom. We know th how God, the martyrs are the glory of the church, how God has inspired so many men and women through the centuries to lay down their lives for the faith. There are many popes, especially in the early church, were martyrs. We understand that, but again, just, the, the, the problems we see, are was, it was not revealed when it was supposed to, and Sister Lucia had said before, when it was to be revealed, uh, she was supposed to have written it on a sheet of paper, but there were four sheets of paper in this new version. Um, there are inconsistencies with the handwriting, and then even some of the the grammatical expressions, the corp meeting corpses or the souls of the corpses, which one are really being met? Uh, uh, sprinkling souls with the blood of the martyrs, what's the idea there? I mean, how, why would you sprinkle um, a soul with the blood of the martyrs? Um, so, and there's nothing, other than those three words, penance, 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 there's nothing else said. And the first and second secrets are all about words. And then all of a sudden we're just given a, vi a, a description of a vision that can be interpreted in so different, so many different ways. Um, uh, even Father Gruner's Fatima organization just said this is really only a whitewash. So many experts, many people who were doing their research were seeing problems with this. And to this day, I don't see the reason to accept that as the authentic Third Fatima secret. We just have to leave that in God's hands, our Blessed Mother's hands. But to finish the, the plot against Our Lady of Fatima, and I know this is, this is controversial, but there has been a lot of research gone into on the identity of Sister Lucia. And if the devil had succeeded in getting, inspiring people here on earth to get rid of the true Sister Lucia as, and to put in an imposter, wouldn't that be quite the coup? And I would just direct you to the, the work that Dr. Peter Hofnowski has, give, has done on this issue. He has a website called sisterlucytruth.org. 
and he has quoted many witnesses saying, I mean, without absolute certitude, but at least with some certitude that the, the pre-Vatican II and the, uh, or at least I should say the pre-1960 and the post-1960 Sister Lucia, there's reason to believe it's not the same person. And there was a, this was a, 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 a part of our Fatima conference a few years ago where Dr. Hothnowski gave a very lengthy explanation of that. And again, uh, you can look it up for yourself, draw your own conclusions. And then I would say the, the last part of the devil's plot against Fatima is to promote false devotion to Our Lady. False devotion. The devil knows he cannot just destroy Fatima completely. There would be too big of an outcry. He cannot destroy Lourdes. Too much of an outcry. He cannot destroy Guadalupe. Too much of an outcry. But what the devil is capable of doing is inspiring people to false devotion to Our Lady. If he can't take Our Lady away completely, he will teach people, he will try to inspire them, I should say, into false devotions to her. And, Saint, and I urge you to read St. Louis's beautiful explanation of this in his book, True Devotion to Mary. Um, and he goes into the seven false devotions, the seven types, and uh, he explains how the devil is an excellent counterfeiter. Uh, is that a good, is that a true word? Counterfeit? Oh, kind of counterfeit is. But anyway, the, the best success a counterfeit coiner could have is not in changing the appearance of base coins or cheap coins, but he'll go for the very best ones or try to make something bad, look into the very best ones like gold and silver. And that's, he says, that's how the devil uh, inspires false devotion to our Lord, to the Blessed Sacrament, and also false devotion to Our Lady. And I think one of the most common false devotions of, to Our Lady is external devotion. You know, just people who on the external will say rosaries, maybe even visit her shrines, but it's not in the heart like it really needs to be. It's not bringing about holiness in their daily life. So there's, the, the, so there's that external devotion, false devotion that he, that he lists, the presumptuous, that's the one that he condemns the most because that's people who don't change their sinful lives on purpose and saying, Our Lady's going to save me. I can live badly and she'll save me. Oh, no. That is very false. So presumptuous uh, devotion, inconstant, up one day, then not the next, you know, um, hypocritical, interested. These are all the various false devotions to uh, Our Lady that St. Louis uh, details. So again, beautiful explanation of that in true devotion to Mary. So I hope that I have shown you a little better the plans of the enemy. <laughs> what the enemy has done already and what he continues to do. And let's not play into the devil's plans. Let's expose his plot against Our Lady of Fatima and let us be more committed apostles and devotees of her who will crush his head. God bless you.